Entertainment.com. Welcome to the original rock and wrestling radio show. Welcome to Beyond Ringside, your source for wrestling, MMA, and boxing in the Southeast. To contact the Ringside Roundtable of Beyond Ringside, email them at beyondringside at gmail.com. And now, your host for Beyond Ringside, the man, no myth, all legend, Fast Eddie Lay. The music plays, the microphones go hot, and we are set and ready to play on a special edition. Welcome to Beyond Ringside, live from the Full Range Entertainment Studios in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you, Mike Macaroni, for the introduction. Always a pleasure to hear from the cheesiest announcer in the business, other than yours truly, of course. I think he's more craft macaroni and cheese, and I would definitely be classified as Lindberger. All of the above. I'd like to welcome in tag team partner, the architect of intellect, the wicked nemesis. What's up, buddy? I'm getting ready for this very special interview. Uh, it's not too often we have anything pre-taped. We like to be live, but for this special occasion, I believe it's it's just due. It really is. Like to welcome in. I can't use the tag special guest anymore. I do have to use extended family member or friend of the family or actually family. We'll put it that far. She is the multi-time National Wrestling Alliance Alliance. <laughs> Women's World Champion, La Reina del Pau Driver, Tasha Simone. Tasha, welcome in. Thank you. And just for the record, I do love my Alabama crew, even when I pick on y'all. <laughs> See, you, Twitter, and that's all I'm going to say. It really I really And ladies and gentlemen, our very special guest at this time for this interview, he is the chief official for the National Wrestling Alliance. Mr. Fred Richards. Fred, welcome in. Good, good to have you on board. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be on board. I have been looking forward to this. I'm really excited about it. And it is always a pleasure to talk about professional wrestling, NWA professional wrestling, which is as good as it gets. Now, in previous days, National Wrestling Alliance has also been followed up with the tag Wrestling for the People. And there are promotions for the NWA all around the country and all around the world, all the way down to Australia, because I know we have a, um, a um, current, I believe, still current world champion who made the first trip down to Australia in a, in a number of years and defended. Um, the belt has been defended in Canada. It's been defended in Mexico and various other countries. But, of course, the home base for the National Wrestling Alliance here is here in the United States. But before we start moving directly into NWA itself, Let's find out a little bit more about Fred Richards. How long have you been a part of the professional wrestling industry? Well, I hate to confess this because, uh, no, I'm not broadcasting from uh, my exhibit space in the Museum of Natural History. <laughs> but I, I have been involved in this. Uh, first of all, the NWA and I, just, just to, to go there for a second, we were both born in the same year of 1948. But I started to get involved. I became a fan of pro wrestling. Uh, in 1959, and it was very interesting how that happened. At that point in history, I lived uh, with my folks, of course, in the Bronx, New York, where I was born and raised, and used to get six hours of pro wrestling on black and white television, on <laughs> Channel 5, uh, which, which is now the Fox Network outlet in New York, but back then it was the old Dumont Network. You got two hours on... Saturdays, which was a week delay from, uh, it was taped in the city arena in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, then you, on, on Tuesday, you got a uh, two-hour segment. It was always from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and that was from Sunnyside Garden in Queens, New York. And then the flagship of it all was on Thursday night, and that was from Vince McMahon Sr.'s home base at the Capitol Arena in Washington, D.C., and I had never really heard of professional wrestling at that point. I was 11 years old, and I never really heard of it. And uh, I just was flipping the channel. There were no remote controls back then. It was good for me. You got some exercise. You had to get up and walk up to the... It was this old friction dial. And all of a sudden, I tuned this thing in, and here are these guys in the ring who I found out later were Buddy Rogers, which is one of my all-time favorites, he and his manager, Bobby Davis, 
was stuck in one corner of the ring, and they were about to receive the big splash from Haystacks Calhoun. I watched this organized mayhem until it went off at 11 o'clock, and I was hooked. I was hooked. And, of course, we only had one TV set back then. There were no computers. I don't even think the word was in the lexicon at that point. And I would watch it three times a week, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, got my, my dad to take me to some shows in the New York area. You really weren't supposed to go at that time because the Athletic Commission said that uh, you uh, couldn't go into a pro wrestling show unless you were 14. And I was 11, 12, up through 13, and it was the good old don't ask, don't tell back then. Uh, Plus a $5 bill in the hand of the Athletic Commission has seemed to work wonders. Working, wishing people Merry Christmas in July seems to work to this day. There you go. And one of the my favorite matches, and I'm, I'm going to make everybody drool as to what the ticket prices were. I was in row one the night that Bruno San Martino beat Buddy Rogers in 48 seconds in New York's old Madison Square Garden, the real Madison Square Garden. That ringside seat cost $5, and the program was $0.10. If you went to the lesser arenas, like Sunnyside Garden, the Island Garden, uh, ringside was $4. It was a fantastic uh, period in history. When I was 14, just on a whim, I was buying the wrestling magazines, and at that time, this was before even wrestling reviews started, uh, all you had in both the Ring magazine, which was primarily a boxing publication, right. you had maybe a half dozen pages that were devoted to wrestling, and then you had Boxing Illustrated uh, Wrestling News, which was the precursor to the late Stan Weston's Wrestling Review. So right. one day I said, let me write this column. And all I did was I wrote co the column with some results and a little bit of editorial comment. I wrote it on a piece of loose-leaf paper, and I used a fountain pen. And I sent it to the late Nat Lubit, who was the son-in-law of Nat Fleischer, who owned Ring Magazine. And I waited and I waited, and two months later I go to the newsstand. I think the magazine cost a quarter back then. And I go through to where the wrestling pages appeared. And there's my column with my own name. And brother, was I just, I was 20 feet tall. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Next thing I knew, I called down to, uh, to Nat Lobin. Now, I was a kid. I was in my teens, for heaven's sake. And he said, why don't you come down to the office? And their office was on the mezzanine of the old Madison Square Garden, nice. which was on 8th Avenue between West 49th and West 50th Streets in Manhattan. So I took the subway down. We didn't have a car back then. If you had one, you couldn't park in Manhattan. I took the subway down all by myself. I went up there, and I walked in to what had to be the most comprehensive museum. It was a virtual tabernacle. They had all sorts of, of boxing gloves that were worn by Joe Lewis, Floyd Patterson, going all the way back. And they also had this section for wrestling. And what happened that day really charted the course for me because Nat Lubit came over to me. This was back in the old days when people who were executives, they really wanted to see the younger people get ahead. There was none of the paranoia you see right. where, where people wanted to sabotage you or, or set sand traps for you. He put in my hand, which I have somewhere in, in, in my, uh, my study, my very first press card. I was a teenager, and I had a press card, and I started getting into the shows at Madison Square Garden, Sunnyside Garden, St. Nicholas Arena, the Island Garden in Hempstead, the Long Island Arena in Comac, and I was covering wrestling shows. I borrowed my late uncle's camera, and of course, back then, digital, forget it, digital, that was a, a digit was a number or a finger or something like it that. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I had an old 35-millimeter camera that used flash bulbs. And you had to guess as to what the F-stop, the exposure was. And I started writing stories. And my first story was published in uh, 1964. And it was on the late George MacArthur, who wrestled as Man Mountain Cannon. And his opponent in the match was the great Antonino Rocca. And I wrote that story. I'm looking at it right now. It is up on the wall in my study. 
and that was my first feature length story. In 1966, I hadn't even graduated high school yet, mind you. I, I graduated high school in June of 1966. And in October of, of the same year, I went into the military. It was Vietnam. The draft was on. I really didn't want to go to college at that point in my life, so I went into the service. And before I went over to Vietnam, uh, I was in San Angelo, Texas, a good fellow Air Force base. And I used to go to these, these shows that were run in Abilene by Don the Lawman Slatten and his wife Sylvia. And then he started running at the San Angelo, Texas Coliseum, which of course is still there today. And I would go and he, I'd cover the matches, I'd do interviews, met some great guys there, the Von Brauners, Saul Weingroff, the original Alaskan Jay York, Cowboy Bill Watts was still wrestling. Yep. It was the old territory day. One night I'm sitting there, because I would double as the timekeeper sometimes. Mm. Uh, once I even did the ring announcing. But the referee was Dale Stewart, who was actually Dale Slatton, Don's brother. Right. And there were no barriers, there were no, uh, there were no mats out on the floor, so one day it was the main event. And Dale went out of the ring the hard way, and he split his head open. It was far from pretty. And all of a sudden, here comes Don. And he looks at me and he says, get your New York butt in the ring. And I said, I've never done this. He says, you've been watching it long enough. Get in there and referee the match. Now, I'm in street clothes. I had shoes with leather soles on, which uh, might be great for fashion, but on the canvas of a wrestling ring, they're not too good for traction. And I get kidded to this day when I talk to him because that first match that I ever did was Thunderbolt Patterson versus Dory Funk Jr., and every time I talk to Junior, uh, he always goes back to that and he kids me about it because if there were mistakes to be made, I made every single one of them. But uh, from that point on, I had been bitten by the wrestling bug and I really didn't want to recover. I went overseas, took a little bit of hiatus. When I got back, I uh, got back into refereeing. Uh, I would work for anybody that would hire me. It was a point in time because I returned to the Bronx when I was discharged. I started attending my undergraduate work at Pace University in Manhattan where my father uh, taught. And at that time, the New York State Athletic Commission was a good old boys club. You really, really, really had to know somebody to get in. You couldn't get a referee's license. And I had a New York referee who I, I, I loved dearly. A uh, man named Terry Terranova, who was a very animated referee, and I was fascinated watching him because he eclipsed the rest of the referees. At that time in New York, the referees actually wore gray work clothes with a black bow tie. There were no stripes. There were, it wasn't even the blue shirts. It was a gray shirt, gray trousers, black shoes, and a uh, black bow tie. I got to know Terry at ringside, I got to know some of the guys, Georgie Brown, rest in peace, the timekeeper, the famous Johnny Addy, one of the best ring announcers uh, that ever got inside long before Howard Finkel, long before, I don't even think Michael Buffer was born back then. And uh, it was still hard to get the license. And uh, I was naive at that time, I mean the idea of slipping somebody an envelope, that was something you saw in a black and white movie, that just didn't happen. At that time, I started my career, my, my real career, which was with the, uh, uh, and the uh, at that time it was called the New York City Transit Authority, and I was elected into union office after that, and part of my job was to testify at City Hall. We were getting into the pre-Giuliani days. David right. Dinkins was the, uh, was the mayor back then. And I got to know some of the high-profile city councilmen some of the assembly men, and one day I was talking to one of them, and I said, gee, I do this refereeing of wrestling, but I can't do it in New York, and they said, why the hell not, and I said, because I can't get a license, I would go down to the commission in, in lower Manhattan, not far from where the uh, World Trade Center used to be, and uh, I basically get the door slammed in my face, he said, come and see me next week, I went to see him next week. And, of course, I won't mention the politician's name because between the time I first saw him and next week, uh, somebody, somebody educated me the way business was done in New York City politics. And uh, I sent the Christmas card, although I was wearing short sleeves at the time. 
And I went down to the New York State Athletic Commission, and they did everything but roll out the red carpet. And it was one of the one of the wildest places in the world. The chairman of the Athletic Commission that time, and he was quite punchy, but a dear, dear man, was the late boxer Floyd Patterson. Yes. And you had to go in, and you had to get a physical, and the physical had to be done there. And they had this this woman, and if anybody who, who was ever to the commission is listening to this, they'll remember Eva. And Eva would do the, AK, the EKGs. You had to have a cardiogram. And Eva had a very unique way of doing the EKG. She had this fondness for men's nipples. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those stories that you usually tell when you do your memoirs later in life. But she was a, 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 a nice little woman. I mean, you, you had to get her a dozen roses. But when you laid on that table, if she took a liking to you, it was a very, it was uniquely rewarding experience. But it stopped there. I mean, there was nothing overtly sexual about it other than she liked, she got her satisfaction out of tweaking men's nipples, bless her heart. And uh, I got my, my license. And then the best day came for me. I, the commission assigned the referees there. Uh, the, the referees were paid based on the attendance at the show. And the number of referees were assigned based on the uh, model that they had as to what they figured the attendance would be in the size of the building. So I was getting the indie shows, but I was happy to be working. And I modeled my style after Terry Terranova. Now, a lot of time had gone by. One day I find myself assigned to a show out in Staten Island, in Richmond County in, in New York City. And I do the show, and of course, the commission in New York, they picked the promoter's pocket for every morsel they could get. You had a doctor, you had a medic, you had a judge, you had an inspector, none of whom did anything, and most of whom were gone by the second match, so long as they had been paid. And I noticed that this judge was staying there for the entire show. And I look at him saying, I know this guy. I know him, I know him, I know him. At the end of the show, we had eight matches. I was the only ref. And he comes over to me, and he puts his hand around me. And he said, you learned well. And I said, oh, my God, it's Terry Terranova. <laughs> and getting validated by your mentor. Yes. That is better than any award. It is better than any trophy that anybody can give you. And it really touched me, and I will confess, proudly so, that it brought a tear to my eye. Uh, I did a lot of work in New York. I did the first matches for uh, people like Homicide, Loki, when the great Bobby Lombardi used to run the Doghouse Group out at the legendary Elks Lodge on Queens Boulevard. And if you've never worked at the Elks Lodge, you don't know how lucky you are. It is quite a horrible place. It has a chronically backed up men's room. The people that deliver the ring have to literally walk it up the fire escape in Ugh. pieces. And parking on Queens Boulevard in New York, you may park your car. You may not find it when you go to retrieve it. Right. It's a, it's a very interesting place. And, and I know I'm rambling on here, but the memories were great. I worked in, in, in buildings that drove me crazy. The first time I walked into Madison Square Garden, there was only one thing going through my head. One thing. Please don't let me trip on the ring stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all still have that, that, that fear run through we our head do, every once in a while. We do. Oh, believe me. Believe me. Now when I work at this point in my life, I don't want to... I, I, I say, please, don't let the ring ropes snap and hit me south of the border. It would be extremely painful, and I don't know if I have enough life left in me to recover. I've had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... It's, it's something that I love to do. Uh, I, I, I enjoy being part of the team, the team being the wrestlers, the referee, the ring announcer, the, team, the timekeeper, the promoter, uh, the people that present the product to the wrestling consumer. We work as a team. We support one another. We shelve all our differences. I don't care where you come from, what religion you are, what color you are. When there is a team to give people who laid down their hard-earned, sweat-laden wages to see us. And if we are to be professionals, we give them everything we have. Whether there's 10,000 people in the building or 10 people in the building, and yeah, I've worked a few shows where there were nine people in the building, so I know the feeling. But that's what I've done. I've done some, 
some high profile matches i've been fortunate enough to uh, work with some people whom i've developed a tremendous affection for as friends a tremendous respect for as professional wrestlers and i've met some professional wrestlers who may be wrestlers but they're not professional i'm sure that uh, that tasha can corroborate she has had the same experience in that respect too Absolutely, uh, it's a huge blessing. Yes, yes, but uh, Tasha, whom I have a very, very uh, broad spectrum respect for, uh, she lives this business. When she gets in the ring, her work product speaks for itself. If you want to know what Tasha Simone is, then just simply go to a card where she is going to be in one of the matches, and you will see wrestling the way it should be because she is not in there to be a piece of eye candy. She is in there to be a professional wrestler who just happens to be a woman, okay? And if everybody had that same ethic, if everybody practiced that same code of conduct when the bell rang, I think that women's wrestling would have a much higher degree of respect within the profession. It is not a low-core pornography exhibition. It is two female athletes who get in there and can go as good as, if not sometimes better, than their male counterparts. But let me get back to the referee. And, and, and then I'll, I'll come up for air and you can, you can ask me whatever questions you want. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my career. Uh, right after we all survived the uh, horrific attack of September 11th at... Uh, I was right there for best best break of my life was the New York City subway system around eight minutes late that day because I was on my way to a meeting at uh, Seven World Trade Center. Wow! But right after that uh, is when I uh, began the phase of my refereeing career that got me over to Japan. Uh, I am a big guy. Okay, I'm six foot one and a half inches tall, and at that point in time, I was about 215 pounds. Now, usually big guys are not the best for rep referees, because you're not supposed to eclipse the workers, some of <laughs> whom are, are, are a bit shorter than that. And oh, it maybe just one doesn't or two. Look good. Yeah, it, it just doesn't look good. It's not, it's not the rule of thumb. But I did one of the NWA annual events that was promoted by my good friend Howard Brody, yeah. and it was down in Florida, and it was Shinya Hashimoto, uh, against Steve Carino, who was the NWA world champion at that point in time. And it was one of the stiffest matches that I had ever worked. It was my first time in the ring with a Japanese wrestler who practiced the strong style right. that they do overseas. And Carino, who is a very brave young man, uh, is not afraid of pain, took some horrible horrible kicks i mean i was right there i was about eight or nine inches away and he took about three or four kicks to uh, his right temple and his eye was hanging out and uh, i stopped it it was the only thing to do because he wasn't going to uh he wasn't going to tap out he wasn't going to concede and i had to stop it because hashimoto was not going to pin him he just kept kicking him and carino was there do it again do it again i'm saying to myself what the hell is the matter with you Go put your head under a steamroller. It's quicker. <laughs> so I stopped. <laughs> and then, then a, a couple of weeks later, I get a call because one of the people who was there was a gentleman named Yoshiyuki Nakamura, who at that point was one of the principals, along with Hashimoto, in the Zero One promotion, right. which split away from New Japan. And they wanted me to come over and referee. And I said you know, something didn't make sense to me. I'm not the most athletic referee, okay, and I'll be the first one to say that. I can be a bit gawky in the ring. The only difference between me and other referees is my style is the Terry Terranova style. I'm vocal. I'm animated. Uh, I tend to prompt a lot in the match, and if I get in there with the right people, I think we put on something that gives the fans their money's worth. So they took me over there. And the match at that point, uh, Hashimoto got the title, and the match was going to be Hashimoto. The main event in Corrigan Hall was Hashimoto against the legendary Dan Severn, whom I just spoke to the other day, is winding up his mixed martial arts career. 
uh, and we went over there. And uh, let's just say that the way the match went down, uh, it was not my finest hour as far as professional ethics go. And the match ended with a very controversial, they say it was fast, I say it was normal, somewhere in between lies the truth. And the way I finished the match, the place went on fire. They stormed the ring without any exaggeration. So help me almighty God, they had to get me out of Japan. We were staying at a hotel in the Rapongi district, which is like the red light district in, in Amsterdam or in Manhattan, if you know where to find it. And uh, they had to get me out to Narita Airport. And the people over there, wrestling is mainstream. I was in Japan when Lou Fez died. And it was like you had lost Mickey Mantle back here in the States or Babe Ruth. Right. Fez was held in such high regard. Front page stuff on the... It was like having his picture on the New York Times back here in the USA. That's how significant it was. Uh, and I go home, got my payday. They were very generous, got my payday. And next thing I know, I get contacted by Simon Inoki. Hmm. And he said, they want you to go on a three-week tour in Japan. And stupid me, I can't feel, what is it they want me to do? I went over there, we had the match, you know, I, I get out. It's referee angles. They're, they're few and far between, thank goodness. And then I realized my own rule. Now, Tasha's never been to one of the locker room meetings, and I usually say a little piece, and it goes like this. I usually tell the people, I usually tell the workers before the show starts, I said, let's remember something. I said, how does a promoter measure the worth of a wrestler? And I've done promoting, and at least this is my yardstick. I don't measure it by what I see because everybody and their mother can do high spot, high spot, high spot. <laughs> I measure it by what I hear. Right. Because not to demean the work of Tasha and, and, and many others like her, but a lot of what we do is not the Olympics. It's the theater. We're a soap opera. We're a soap opera that acts out via athletic competition in the form of pro wrestling. The ring is our stage. We have an audience. We are, in the truest definition of the words, arena seating. We have four sides to the ring. The smart wrestler knows how to give each one of those four sides their money's worth. I've seen others that have played to walls. It makes me sick. They just don't know where they are in the ring. And part of my job as a referee is to sort of give them a little reminder that, hey, the, the bricks don't buy the tickets. Those flesh and blood people out there do. And, you know, the other thing I always say to wrestlers is congratulations. There's 2,500 people who paid money to see you tonight. Fine. But wrestling, like other business, depends on repeat patronage. Right. So give them a reason tonight to want to come back next month and the month after. Right. And, 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 and that's why I have an affection for the old style. The best series of matches. I never got, I've worked with these guys as individuals, but never when they did their program. The best, one of the most profitable series of matches here on the East Coast, which never ran as main event, which never involved a championship belt, was Sergeant Slaughter against the Iron Sheik. Right. You had the flag waving GI and the evil guy from the Arab world. It was a natural. And they did it four times in Madison Square Garden. They did it in the Boston Garden. They did it in Baltimore. They did it in Washington. And then they did the blow-off match, which, of course, was the foreseeable bloodbath. It had the place on fire. And it was usually done in the middle of the card. And I use that often as an example to young workers. I said, look at what they did. Look at how they excited the crowd. Look at the merchandise sales. Look at the other things that are designed to help you make a living in your chosen career path. Uh, the one thing I did that was really, really interesting, because I made some notes here of some of my favorite matches. So I'll go to the... I, I won't even say it was the worst one that I did, but it really took a drubbing in the press, and it was ruined by one person. And I, I will not sully your broadcast by mentioning that individual's name, because he ain't on my Christmas card list. Uh, I did the uh, legendary, back on October the 10th of 1999, the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view from Biloxi, Mississippi. Nice. 
And we went down there having been told that it was going to be a quarterly event. Uh, it was booked by my good friend Mike O'Brien, who used to be the NWA member in New York State, uh, and the fellow Bill Stone from Foss Stone Productions in Washington, uh, he wanted to do this on a quarterly basis. Well, unfortunately, the rookie mistake that they made is they had nobody policing the locker room. And the bottles there didn't contain water, they didn't contain chocolate milk, and they didn't contain Pepsi-Cola. And the people that were scratching their nose didn't have an itch, at least not, in, not, not right away. Ouch. And some of them went into the ring and they destroyed it. And this is something that Tasha and I have talked about. You know how they say that one bad apple can ruin the basket? Yep. Well, it was no different. Because a couple of people went out there and they did things that were obscene. They wasted valuable, expensive uplink time. And what was supposed to be a, uh, a quarterly production ended up being a one-night wonder. And every so often I pull out that, that DVD because I did two matches, but the one that I, that stood out in my mind because it was a brawl to end all brawls was the one man gang versus Abdullah the Butcher. It was a bloodbath. And, uh, Abdullah and I, we've worked many times. We get along. Uh, I like him. I know how he works. Uh, the other one I got along with probably because we're both a little bit insane was, uh, George the Animal Steel. And George would go after me religiously whenever we worked high-profile shows in New York and New Jersey. And he would kid me because he would actually bite me. I mean, if anybody thought he wasn't biting me, he bit me. I had the, had the teeth marks to prove it. And he says to me, come here, Fred. I like kosher meat. I want another bite. <laughs> and he would, he, 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 he would get me. But, you know, the thing that I did when I say I had an animated style, and I still do this, is I, is I give a very vocal two. I've seen pictures, and my wife always tells me that it looks like my eyeballs are going to pop out. And, and, and an anecdote, the, the, the third time, I've, did, I've done 12 tours over to, to Japan. And the third time I went there, uh, I go through the check-in, which is as comprehensive as it here, is here in the United States, with the uh, check of your, your, your luggage. Uh, even if you're going to put it in the hold of the aircraft, they, they check it. Right. And the one guy says, you, and they're so polite, you can't get mad at people. They're, they're so polite. It's not like in the airport where they give you an ultimatum and they have a scowl on their face or they look like their underwear is on too tight. And this cute little Japanese girl, because Japan, Japanese women, it's like you died and went to Cupid doll heaven. They are adorable. And she says, would you mind coming here? So I say to myself, what am I going to tell her yes and become a guest of the emperor? So I go over. She starts to open my bag. All of a sudden, this guy who had a hat on that looked like he was Douglas MacArthur with all the cloud and darts on. Oh, hi, hi, no, no, he, he, number two, two, two. And I was on my way. He was, a, he was somebody who had been uh, in the audience at a pay-per-view we did in the legendary Zumo Hall. And I guess he gave me a professional courtesy. I'm sure if his boss saw it, he wouldn't like it in case I was carrying a nasty device, which I wasn't. But it was, it was just such a, a funny thing. And the, the Japan thing spilled over. Two years ago, my wife and I were on a celebrity cruise ship on a transatlantic cruise. And there were some, some Japanese passengers, fellow passengers. And we're going into dinner one night. And people came over. And, uh, you know, even though I'm my age, we all know that my hair is, is naturally dark. Yeah, that and, uh, sure it is. But, uh, they came <laughs> over and, and, <laughs> and they recognized me. And I was, I was flattered. I'm, a, I do a wrestling referee gimmick. I mean, you know, come on, what am I, uh, Robert De Niro? And, uh, we had a nice discussion. And I am a believer, I, I do not break the moray of the industry. I became interested in this industry at a time when the business of the industry, the term of art, as you all know, is kayfabe. I believed in it then. I believe in it now. I think when kayfabe was broken, we made the job a lot harder for the workers. Uh, I don't think we did ourselves a favor to the point it is now where everything is more easily predicted than tomorrow's weather. But those are some of the things. So ask away. I got a bunch more here, but it's your program, not mine. Let me lead off with one. And you mentioned the factor of buying the first camera. 
And remember, yes. remembering the time frame, this is the photo nerd in me coming out for a second, and we're going to get to the wrestling side in about 8.7 seconds. Was the fr- if Remembering the time frame, was the first camera a Pentax or a Minolta? First camera was a Konica. Ah! Forgot about that. It was a Konica. And I used to use those blue dot flash bulbs. Yep. You had the flash guns where it would open up like a Japanese fan, like a butterfly design or a yep. rose petal. I remember. And that's exactly what I had, and guess what? I still have it. I believe it. I actually, uh, when I first started shooting in, like, 1987, I still had my first Nikon FM. Well, I also had a Yashica twin lens reflex where you looked into that little glass screen yes. with the grid on it. Yes. Uh, you know, you, uh, telephoto lenses back then, they, they, they were rare, and if they existed, they were very, very expensive. Yeah. Amazon was nothing but a, a river in the jungle at that Correct. time. Correct. So, uh, there were there were no discounts, but, uh, but nowadays digital photography, which I enjoy, uh, the last cruise we took a few months ago, I took like, uh, geez, I, I took about six six thousand pictures. Of course, if I kept one in in three hundred, it was a lot. But it's it's a very forgiving art where you had it, and I always shot slides because I was a purist when it came to color. And as you well know, slide processing was far different and the dyes were much better than they were for print film when when Kodak and Fuji were were in their heyday. It was either E6 processing or K14 processing. You have an excellent memory. Yes, I used did. to work in the in the industry. <laughs> yep, yeah, Kodachrome and you had Ektachrome. Yep. Yes, you did. And actually Fuji Chrome was based on the E6 uh um the the the, the uh, Kodachrome and uh, Kodachrome was the red and gold, Ektachrome was the uh, blue and silver. That's right. Mm-hmm. Those little cartridges that you had, and then if you didn't catch it just right when you went to roll up the tension and you started snapping away and all of a sudden you thought you were done and you found out that you never had any film in your camera. I did that too. That's right, because actually I had a Yashica Flex twin lens at one point uh-huh. in time and I had to let it go because of uh, extenuating circumstances. I think she may still have it to this day. However, However. <laughs> you make a reference to the team aspect. Yes. And there is something that I have said for a number of moons, and I'm sure that everybody on this show will agree, that there are three things that you have to have in this industry. You can financially make it in this business if you work it properly, if you learn your craft, if you apply your trade properly. You can even make it further in this business by navigating certain channels. But I've always found that there's three things that you have to be able to prove that you have for this business. One, You have to have respect for the business itself. You have to have respect for the team aspect as well as the fun side of this business. You can have the word fun and business in the same sentence, but you also have to be able to have, be able to have, a respect for the tradition of this business. One of our panelists right now on the show is, and I'm saying this in a slight manner, but I'm not slighting when I say it, is big about homework and helping people understand and research the tradition and the history of this business. First off, I tip my hat to that, to a great degree. And I wish that kids who are getting into this business would do that instead of just sitting back going, hey, I like what's on TV, and and, and I want to do this, and, 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 but but. Okay, that was a gimmick voice. That was actually what I used to do in FM radio. However, there is a point where you can see the here and now, but you have to understand where we came from in this business in order to be able to genuinely appreciate it. And I think that the people who actually have the opportunity, when given the opportunity to do that, Respect the industry, respect the business, respect the sport, and respect all facets of it that much more. Agree or disagree? I could not agree more, and I say to you, bravo. Bravo. Your prescription would cure some of the ills that tragically are being perpetuated in rings all across the United States. Let's bring in the Oracle of Ominous, the Wicked Nemesis. What we're talking about makes it's common sense and it's common courtesy, but that's not how it is. This entire industry is made and paved on the bones of people that respected it. People that, that gave everything they had for this business. Those people have 
almost absolutely nothing to show for. The people that look out for themselves and the people that kiss ass the most and the people that did the most shadiest things made the most money in this business. Whether we like it or not, the NWA has continued a tradition of pushing real wrestling as it should. But all of them should. Wrestling is in the name. But when you talk about respect, <laughs> there's not a lot of respect in this business. If there was respect in this business, people would not kill their boyfriends, their girlfriends, their their lovers, their mistresses, their their homosexual lovers, whoever. They wouldn't tell anybody about that, what goes on, but they do. Respect's lacking in this business. And it starts because you look at the guys right now, and we're not going to name any names, but we all know who they are. The guys who made billions of dollars for people in this business. The guys who sold the most merchandise. A lot, not all, but a lot of those guys hated this business. A lot of those guys could care less about this business, and it goes on right now. There's people in this business that are only in it for money, for whatever reason. We all have our different reasons why we got into the business. Well, I don't think we need to really go into that, but we all got into this business for different reasons. But you respect, is, but respect is, is, you know, really... I don't know. I guess I should say it's not dead, but to me, respect's dead. Kayfabe is not, but there's very, very. I walked up to somebody, and you heard me say this the other night on, on another show. I had to walk up to a promoter that was treating everybody like they were marks, everybody like they were fans. And I'm like, dude, you're a promoter. You see everyone in here. I had to go and put my hand in this guy's face to get a handshake. That's what's lacking in this business. And until we, until we can get the foundation, until you can get people to stop coming into this business, until you can take care of that, it's going to continue to run rampant. There's people right now that don't know to shake hands. I shake hands with everybody, as you should. I shake hands, I shake hands with people that pick up the trash. I don't care. They're part of the show. It's respect. I may not like them. There's a lot of people I don't like, but I still shake their hands out of respect. I think that is the fundamental thing with this. Even though respect the the most respected people in this business aren't the ones that are on top right now and aren't the ones that have made the most money. We all know that. That's just the cold, hard truth, I guess. Mr. Richards. You have a remarkable insight into it. Respect is the cornerstone, and no building can stand if they don't have a solid foundation or yes, cornerstone. Uh, there is a ritual that is part of this business. And we've gotten away from it. We're forgetting where we came from. Therein is the danger. I'm seeing more of what I like to refer to as the iPad, iPhone, iPod mentality, which is the instant gratification, uh, you know, and, and, and I use that term for a reason. I blame and MTV. I'm sorry? I blame MTV. <laughs> yeah. But you, you have... You, you you have respect when people don't know the meaning. Respect does go beyond uh, a limp-wristed, two-fingered handshake in a dressing room. The traditions. If it were up to me, there would be a prerequisite before anybody got booked in a promotion. And that would be to sit down, tell me why you want to be a wrestler, tell me what you know about the business, <laughs> what, what piece. <laughs> What piqued your interest? I'm getting laughed at. Tell me why. No, 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 because we've actually had this conversation. I'll explain, I'll explain in a minute. Go ahead. Okay. Well, well, no, I, I firmly believe that. I mean, people are getting in. And the one thing, if there is one absolute profanity that gets me in a state of rage, it's when I hear about, oh, yeah, well, we booked him because he sold 30 tickets. He doesn't know a drop kick from a mule kick. Okay, but he sold 30 tickets. Oh, he owns the ring. We're going to make him the champion. Eh, wrong answer. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Mr. Richards. And then next thing you know, those exact people that you're talking about are then training people. Yeah. Y yeah. I mean, I think this is what, what Wicked Insight is, uh, Wicked Nemesis, I'm sorry, is talking about with his insight. I think he's right on the flight path. These are the types of things where if a promoter, Okay, if a promoter understands this business, if he respects this business, if he knows how this business grew in the days when audiences were, were way ahead number-wise, revenue-wise. You remember there was a time in this business when some of the top people 
when some of the top people who Wicked Nemesis was referring to, uh, they made their payday based on a percentage of the turnstile. Right. They didn't have a set payday. <clears throat> and they couldn't do that. They couldn't do that if there wasn't a plentiful take at the box office. You try that now. I see some of these shows. I see people, oh, well, no, no, no. Uh, oh, gee, $8 a ticket. They got 40 people in the audience. You don't have to be a mathematical genius right out of Rutgers to understand that profit or a reasonable payday for somebody that just went out and took bumps and bruises is impossible. So I fully agree. If I could wave a magic wand and rid this industry of some of the people who simply want to play wrestling promoter as if they were attending an ongoing masquerade ball, I would do it faster than you could say Jackie Robinson because it makes me sick. I've seen this business since 1959. I've seen it go downhill. I've seen it peak. I've seen it change as far as uh, the mores, as far as the, the genre of the product, and it, it ain't what it used to be. I mean, when I used to see extreme wrestling, it wasn't somebody going out there and doing gratuitous bloodletting. It wasn't somebody having a midget sexually pleasure himself in a garbage can. It wasn't somebody doing a sexual stereotype of, of a gay person or of a female. I saw a dangerous Danny McShane and Bull Curry wrestle in Texas on St. Patrick's Day, and the gimmick in that match was the loser got painted with green enamel. <laughs> that was part of the fun of wrestling, but before they got to the paint bucket, they beat the hell out of each other. Don Slatton, Cowboy Bob Ellis, Johnny Valentine Sr., the original guy, these guys were extreme before, before Paulie Dangerously's parents were old enough to fornicate. That was wrestling. They just went out and they wrestled. They didn't have a name to it. There were no pyrotechnics. There was no fancy ring rubs. Buddy Rogers used to come out to the ring with a strut and a white towel in his hand. That's all he had. That is all he had. And he electrified the crowd. He wrestled Pat O'Connor two out of three falls the night he won the championship in Comiskey Park. Pack the place. Pack the place. Bruno San Martino. Now, there's, there is a pillar of integrity. He's not going to be put into the WWE Hall of Fame because of what was done to the business by that malignancy on a hill in Stanford, Connecticut. Forgive me, but it's coming out of me because Wicked Nemesis has awakened the sleeping giant, as Admiral Yamamoto once said. Okay? He was a wrestler. He looked the role, he acted the role, and he gave everybody who bought a ticket their money's worth. And he was somebody that a father could point to and tell his son, that is a professional wrestler, that is a professional athlete. Have we lost our way? My God, have we lost our way. You are exactly correct. You see all these people, and they're dressed like the people that buy the tickets. They don't yeah. know how to dress as a champion. They come, and they've got their little Walmart shirts on, and then they go to the ring and, the, and their bicycle pants, and it makes me sick. Tasha, we've had this conversation. Yes, and, it's, and, and I'm really going to fire you up now, Fred. Do you me a favor. guys have heard me say this Tasha, religiously. Tasha, one second. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, no. ladies and gentlemen, NWA Women's World Champion, Tasha Simone, come on in. Fred, people forget one of the most important aspects. Before I even get to the formula of professional wrestling that has been lost, people forget one of the most important aspects. And I'm not talking about the fans. I'm talking about the wrestlers and the promoters. There is a reason that the wrestling ring is set above the crowd. Professional wrestlers are to be larger than life. They are not to be Billy Jack or Bobby Joe that's going to go drink a beer and smoke a cigarette with you out behind the building after they're done wrestling. And it is unfortunate, and I blame it on everybody. I blame it on the locker room, not policing the locker room. Because when I got into the business, if you weren't a professional wrestler and you hadn't earned the right to be in that locker room and you walked in it, not only did you get the crap beat out of you, you got the crap beat out of you and you got thrown out. 
And it didn't happen in the rain because it wasn't about pleasing everybody. It was about protecting what we hold sacred. Wrestling has become like the fast food industry. Anybody can set up a ring on a corner in a building anywhere and say, I am a professional wrestling instructor. That does not make them able to teach someone to be a professional wrestler. It only means somebody's going to be stupid enough to give them the money. I have advocated this for years. If you wouldn't go get a tattoo from somebody, if you've never seen them hold a tattoo gun before, why in the hell would you go to anybody to put your life and your body in their hands to teach you how to be a professional wrestler when they cannot show you any credentials or not one single trainee that they have turned out that is worth a crap? The reason I was laughing about you, about why you become a professional wrestler, when I was trained by the very wonderful, very late gentleman Chris Adams, one of the first things that he did with every single student that sat in the room with him was ask them why you want to be a professional wrestler. And there is a right and a wrong answer to it. If it is anything besides I want to be a larger than life superstar that can elicit emotion from people and make them cry if I need to and want to kill me the next minute, then you have the wrong answer. The formula to professional wrestling is that we are a family. Wrestling is no longer a family, and it sickens me. When I wrestled in Texas, when I walked in a locker room, I may hate everybody's guts, but for those few hours that we were in that venue, putting our safety in one another's hands, and yes, it was crowbar potatoes, so sometimes we got black eyes and busted teeth and broken bones. But that's okay because, as Tommy Gilbert used to say, it was good for the business, kid. The fact is, we were a family. We played together, we fought together, we stuck together, and we protected the one thing that was completely sacred. It wasn't accessible to everybody, because if everybody could train successfully to be a professional wrestler, there would be nobody left to buy a ticket. Okay, I'm going to take a breath now. No, don't, don't ever stop. Okay, voices like yours, voices like Eddie's, voices like Wicked Nemesis must never be silenced because they're all we have of our roots because people today are lazy. They want immediate, immediate gratification. They don't understand that you have to crawl, you walk, you run. If you try and go from crawling to running, you're going to fall on your nose. And when you do that in a wrestling ring, Tasha used one word that's a hot button with me. And that word is safety. We are there to protect each other. I have seen people do stupid things. I have seen them put the other people that are in the ring up to and including ring announcers at horrible risk. Yep. And even though they get a pop from the crowd, Tasha is absolutely right. When I was in the service, we called it a blanket party. And uh -huh. it, was, it was a good lesson. It was a lesson that was remembered. It wasn't a time out or go stand in the corner or no MTV for the next nine and a half minutes. Uh, you went away understanding that the consequences of your error, omission, or arrogance could have been catastrophic. People earn their living in pro wrestling. Whether they do it full time, whether it's a significant part of their living as an avocation, they still really don't want to come out of that ring because somebody who was in that ring had no business being there and they were either a ticket seller, the nephew of the promoter, the son of the sponsor, or somebody like that, or they went to one of these rinky-dink training schools and they crippled someone. We've seen errors like that. We've yep. seen deaths in the ring because things went bad, because there was inadequate training. And I'll end my thought with this. I wasn't a real popular guy in New Jersey. But I was one of the people, when they sought to deregulate wrestling, who testified in favor of keeping it under the New Jersey Athletic Control Board. And the reason I did that is because I believed it was foreseeable that once, exactly what Tasha said, when any Jane or Joe could set up a wrestling ring in any garage, in any backyard, and call it a pro show and charge admission, not have to have the necessary insurance to protect uh, the employees, meaning the workers, not have the necessary insurance to protect the crowd, maybe had a substandard ring. This became dangerous. Safety is a key word. 
So I wanted, th- this was one time as conservative as a man as I am politically, I wanted government to maintain some sort of control. And unfortunately, I was proven right, because what is going on in the Garden State right now is best described as chaos on the independent wrestling scene. Some of these shows are an absolute insult to the women and the men that have sacrificed their their, their cauliflower ears, uh, their necks, their backs, uh, their knees, and, and sometimes their lives to help build this business so that people can go out and pursue their labors of love. Wicked Nemesis, come on in real quick. Now, we've kind of tap danced around what, 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 what's the root problem is promoters. People that should not even be in the business calling shots. People that have never trained. People that, that you know, never trained. People that, that are untrainable calling shots. I mean, I've worked for guys that knew nothing about the business. I just happened to be on a card with them. Now, <laughs> one thing that three of the four of us have in common is we're, we're very deeply enrooted into the NWA from the southeast, originally from Virginia Beach, uh, now preside in Alabama. And I live and, ble- live and bleed the NWA. The NWA means something to me. And that's the one thing. Now, we can't change any, anything outside of the NWA because... Let's face it, the, these little outlaw shows, because that's what they are, Yeah, <laughs> there's no point in saving them. The, it's survival of the fittest. But within the NWA especially, there seems to be this thing that everybody's afraid of losing bookings. Instead of speaking up when they see that something's not right, instead of, of saying, hey, maybe that's not the best idea, they, do, they would rather sit back and just let it happen and be like, well, you know, not my problem. Well, actually, it is your problem because when something goes bad in the ring, when something when something it is made to look stupid, and we all know we've all been on that card. We've all been on that card where something stupid happens. Unfortunately, I can't let things like that go. There's something inside of me, and I have to say something. And that's the problem is people are afraid to lose bookings. I don't give a crap. If I'm going to be on a card, and Tasha knows this, if I'm going to be on a card, if I see something... I will go and be like, hey, maybe we need to do this because of this. I don't say, hey, I'm not going to do that. You always have to give it. But people are afraid of the truth. People don't want the truth anymore. They wanted some sugar-coatedness of, of sugar candy that they can swallow down to ease their ego because, they, God forbid, you tell somebody, hey, you're not a worker. You're barely a wrestler. And I can't stand that because we all know there's a difference between wrestler and worker. And now everybody wants to be considered a worker. Then when you tell somebody they're not a worker or when it comes out they're I can't believe you just said that. Well, believe it. It's the truth. Now, am I wrong in thinking that you, you, all of you, this is kind of an open system. Am I wrong in thinking that, that there, that that is what, what's going on? I'll kind of speak up on this one. And again, this is something we've touched on before. Fred's heard a little bit of what I've had to say on a couple of shows now. Um, but this is something that's very, very near to, and dear to me. And Wicked, you have actually kind of seen me do this. I don't have a problem speaking up in the locker room. A lot of people have a problem with me speaking up in the locker room because I'm a woman and they don't want to hear it from a woman. There is a young man here in the state of Tennessee that actually quit the business because he walked in the locker room and shook everybody's hand but mine. The next week he found himself booked in the ring with me and he did get stretched. He tapped out several times and I wouldn't let the referee ring the bell. Consequently, he is no longer a professional wrestler because he found out he wasn't a professional wrestler to begin with. I will not allow disrespect around me. We have to start policing ourselves again. It is my job, not as the woman's champion, but as a veteran in this business to say, look, kid, you have talent. I will help you. Now, if that kid doesn't listen, what happens to them is no longer my responsibility. But it is also my job to go up to the people who don't have any business in my locker room and tell them to get out. And I have picked up wrestling bags, and I have thrown them out of my locker room door. And, Fred, you can talk to your friend Mike Cersei about this because I have even done it in his locker room. And if I ever throw a bag out of the locker room and it hits the pavement, I'm not playing, and they better not walk back in the door. 
Well, when I am uh, when I'm a member of the management team, when I when I promote or co-promote a show, I have a simple rule, and I have a simple belief that uh, I've learned in in my professional career, and I believe in as I believe in religion. And that is that nobody has the monopoly on brains, and certainly nobody has the monopoly on ideas. I enjoy exactly. locker room honesty, candor. If, if it's done in a constructive way and not a destructive way, mm -hmm. uh, Tash and I have had uh, talks, and I told her something uh, the last phase of my career when I was an executive in a, in a local transit, transit agency, uh, actually, the state-run transit agency here in New Jersey, I wrote an inter introductory letter to the people that were going to be my staff, and I was very earthy in one paragraph. And it holds true in a locker room, too. I told them, I don't kiss ass, and I don't tolerate people who do. It makes me sick. It's as plastic as can be. I don't have an ego, okay? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't care who you are, but... If you can't be, on, if you're going to be honest, honesty begins with being honest with yourself. Amen. Respect begins with self-respect. Okay. If you come in there and you think you know it all, if you think that what you leave in the bowl doesn't smell, then, then, then do me a favor. Do me a favor. Just get out of my sight. Because I know the type of person you are. I know the only reason you're being kind to me is because you think I can do something for you. It's gold digging, digging in another way, shape, and form. I just, I, I, I am a big believer in getting the NWA back, and I think you're going to see a resurrection of it, uh, a cleansing process, as I said earlier, that I believe is going to be good. Uh, I believe it's long overdue, and I think that it is going to get the people like Tasha and, and the others and, and good people like, uh, like you, Eddie, and like Wicked Nemesis, the, the, the pride, the pride in the product, the pride in getting back to meat and potatoes wrestling, where it's going to take more than a gimmick or, or a $600 wrestling robe to get somebody over, and where the professionals in the locker room are going to show minimal, if any, tolerance towards people whose luggage Tasha should be throwing out on the curb. Now, <laughs> if I only do it if they deserve it, I promise. I really believe that as veterans, it is our duty, it is our job, not only to protect what has been given to us. We don't, I say this often, but I never will be able to say it enough. Professional wrestling owes us nothing. We, who actually believe in it, owe the professional wrestling industry, the business, the sport, no matter what anybody calls it. We are athletes, and this is a sport. We owe it our bodies. We owe it our respect. And we owe it every bit of integrity that we can give it. As a veteran, it's my job to protect what I love, but it is also my job to nurture what I love and the young wrestlers that are coming up. I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have people say, you know what, this kid's got talent, we're going to work with her. I never touched a woman when I first started training. My first two years in the business, I never knew what it was to wrestle a woman. I got the crap beat out of me by men daily. I don't regret it. I am happy for that because it taught me such a different respect for professional wrestling than so many people get. I appreciate it so much more because the people that I trained with did go through a calling out process. They found out that what we do really does hurt. Black eyes happen. Running the ropes break ribs. People don't know that anymore. They don't want to be wrestlers. They want to be entertainers. And like I said before, we have to start putting professional wrestling back in the professional wrestling ring. Well, we need more guardians of the gate in this business. Because you're right, just like we owe our own existence to our parents, to our forefathers, uh, in this industry, which when you look back to the, the, the roots of, of, of wrestling, professional or uh, Greco-Roman, I mean, you're talking about going back to the days... Uh, at the beginning of time, and it's held the interest of audiences, of spectators, for that longer time. It, it, 
far more than baseball, football, soccer, or some of the other weird competitions that, that, that people pass off for professional sports. Professional wrestling begins with every man and every woman who is going to participate, whether they're in the main event or selling popcorn, getting a living, working definition of the word professional. There's six things I really want to drill real quick. Number one, and I'm, you said that you would wave that magic wand faster than somebody could say Jackie Robinson. With all due respect, I would wave that magic wand faster than you can say Ben Hur. Uh, number two, you're making the reference to the um, freeform bloodletting, which seems to be a common occurrence, especially with the advent of extreme championship wrestling and har- the <clears throat> hardcore and or ultra-violent style. On a personal note, and Wicked made the reference to backgrounds in NWA. I'll hit that one in a second. I remember when I'm coming up watching before I got into it, and I go back now and I look over those storylines, I look over those programs, I look over those matches, the way things were built up, the progression. And blood was never shed in the first match, never in the second match, sometimes in the third if they were going toward, per se, a Texas bull rope match, a chain match, or a cage match as the payoff or as the ultra lift for the storyline. So it wasn't a common everyday occurrence. It was something that was used in the final build. Therein lies my next point. It's part of the psychology of the industry and the sport of professional wrestling. I made the reference to the fact that I blame MTV. Everything in this industry changed. The way we know it changed in the 80s. I'm 46 years old. I was born in 1966. Growing up, I grew up on movies such as The Towering Inferno, Airport 75, 76, 77. I grew up on The Poseidon Adventure. I grew up on long-form movies that held your attention. And then when things changed, courtesy of the MTV era and MTV generation, therefore I blame the 80s, our attention span was dumbed down to a great degree. That's why instead of being, when I'm able to sit at Boutwell Auditorium and watch a shoot 50 called 60 minute match, time limit draw with Ric Flair and Bob Armstrong. And kids in this era are like, what's going on after a five minute match, whether it be television or live action? I Like I said, I blame that MTV style of mentality when it comes to the quick cuts and the flashy sets. We're not taught anymore to pay attention for an extended period of time. So I hope I, I hope I laid that one out there in, in, a, in a clear manner. You make a reference to policing the sport, policing the locker room, Tasha, especially on this one. When we have athletes in other sports who have made things so public, case point scenario, the situation with Chad Johnson, case point scenario, Terrell Owens. T.O., I got a world of respect for as an athlete. But when he can't seem to keep everything off the front page because he's not being careful with his own public image, much less his professional image, same thing can be said for a lot of other athletes in every EVERY business and industry and sport. You make a reference to running the ropes or the first time you hit the rope, you know, running the ropes can break ribs. When I was first trained, when I first was taught, how to hit the ropes, not run the ropes, hit the ropes. I was taught the dynamic of the way that everything worked. You put your body in here like this, you're going to be able to take that first step step off and be on balance to hit the next set, whether it be the clothesline, whether it be a hip toss, whether it be on power slam or belly to belly. You were taught to hit the ropes and how to hit the ropes. Not run, We weren't taught to run the ropes. We weren't taught to push ourselves in. We were taught to hit the ropes. There was no molly coddling. There was no babying. You understood. If you hit the ropes wrong, guess what? You can get hurt. You hit the ropes right, you can get hurt. But it's how you. Pl- it's the the intelligence of where you're going at this. And the last one that I want to touch before I open it back up. Background with understanding the National Wrestling Alliance. I am Birmingham born and bred. I'm a Bama boy. And I say that Roll Tide, War Eagle, Go Blazers, and many more teams in my home state. When I grew up watching promotions from Nick Goulas, one of the in 
who has been referred to in, uh, by a number of sta- um, by a number of statisticians as one of the deans of wrestling promotions for the National Wrestling Alliance. Even when he put his son George in the ring, I'm sorry for all that. I'm, I'll apologize on his behalf. When you watched stars from the National Wrestling Alliance based out of the Tennessee promotions and coming down to Birmingham, Alabama, such as the Fuller Golden Welch family, the Tennessee stud Ron Fuller, Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, the Armstrong family, when you watched people like Gypsy Joe, Tojo Yamamoto, when you watched the birth of the Freebirds, Terry Gordy, Michael Hayes, before Buddy Roberts was added to the mix, if you want to say that and I was also watching the World Wide Wrestling Federation on late night Saturday night TV on WWOR out of New York back when Backlund was champion. I wasn't able to watch when San Martino held the strap. I was there through about the second half of um, Backlund's run. But my heart always ran back down this way toward the National Wrestling Alliance promotions. Because it wasn't just a, the even then the World Wide Wrestling Federation seemed like more of a staged show. Whereas you had the chemistry, you had the flow, and you had the psychology involved out of NWA Tennessee. Like, I believe Harry Thornton was the announcer for that particular promotion for Nick Goulas. Down here, Charlie Platt, Rick Stewart were the, um, were the announced team for, and I remember announcers just as well as I remember referees, as well as I remember the in-ring talent. I didn't get a chance to meet all the backstage personnel, the camera operators, the lighting people, yada, yada, yada. But that's where I come in because I know what those letters, what the words National Wrestling Alliance mean to the tradition of this business. When you look, and I advise everybody, please, for the love of God, take a minute away from Monday, Thursday, Friday. Take a look on YouTube, on Daily Motion, reputable video sharing sites, because you can find classic footage of National Wrestling Alliance promotions from all around the country. You can see people like um, Sergeant Slaughter before he was officially Sarge, or Jake Roberts before he was, you know, carrying Damien around everywhere. Rick Steamboat back when the Steamboat Young Blood Young Blood Flair um, feud was around, or the Valentine Flair feud was around. Before Roddy Piper was running around with Cindy Lauper and Lou Albano when he was in the Pacific Northwest, then came over to the Mid Atlantic. You owe it to your if you call yourself a real fan of professional wrestling. Take a look at some of the footage that laid the pathway, that laid the groundwork, and I hate to say it like this, for what has become prostituted into sports entertainment. But you have people out there who are NWA promoters, who are independent wrestling promoters, who respect the tradition that has been laid down. Back when Jack Jack Atkinson, sorry, was running world class when it's okay to say it his son introduces himself that way there you go when you had sam when you had bosch in houston when you even when it was um annie gunkel and paul jones running georgia when the crockett family was in their infancy in the in the in the mid-atlantic area when when geigel was running kansas city the central states area there's a tradition there that a lot of people don't know about and a lot of that tradition is based around the National Wrestling Alliance. You know, I popped huge when Bob Trobich came on. When Tasha made the reference to you, Fred, coming on with us this evening for the special interview, I popped. Because you look at situations. I mean, I've had great conversations with Bill Barons on more than one occasion that have lasted more than an hour, close to two and two and a half on air because of the tradition of this business. And what the NWA name needs to mean to this business. Yes, there's been controversy in recent days. There's been co- there was controversy last year. Well, guess what? There was controversy in World Wrestling Federation and World Wrestling Entertainment. There's controversy in half the um. There was controversy in Ring of Honor, as short as a month ago. There's no perfect world in professional wrestling. The human element is involved. And where you add that five-letter word, human, there's another five-letter word that comes into play quite often, and it's called error. And it's like um, Tasha was ribbing me off-air before we got everything rolling. 
I plug the cords into the computer on. Well, guess what? That's operator error, i.e. human error. <laughs> the fun part about this whole scenario is, and where I take it full circle, in this world of professional wrestling, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, if you learn your craft, if you learn how to ply your craft in the proper manner, you have an opportunity to do something that not a lot of pe that a lot of people try to do, but not a lot of people can do in this business. And I think that answer is basically inset into what I just said. I'll shut up for a minute. Fred, anything you'd like to respond to? Well, uh, to the extent that, that I can. First of all, there are, there are two seminal books that, uh, in my role as uh, a member of the NWA Board of Directors, my future role in the organization, and as a promoter, that have helped me. One of them was written by the great Donald Trump, it's called the art of the deal. Yes, and the other one, believe it or not, because this the, 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 this this name I'm about to say is is an obscenity to some people in the business. But when you write, you write. It doesn't matter who you are. And that was Eric Bischoff's book that controversy, controversy creates, creates cash. cash. And if you get the moral of that story, it does. Wrestling is controversial from the opening bell until curfew is called. It's supposed to be. Otherwise, it would be disgustingly vanilla, the proverbial hot dog minus mustard. Right. Uh, I do agree that the NWA drifted away. Now, you cite, accurately so, the 80s, the rock and wrestling connection. That was done. Remember the Vince McMahon Jr. I had the honor of knowing his father. Okay. The apple fell very far from the tree. <laughs> no, the hurricane blew that some. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And I could say it in a, in a more matter of fact way. But uh, not only is there a, a lady, also a woman, of course, whom I respect on the line. Ditto but, that. Uh, I'm not going to say what, what's coming to mind right now. But uh, the son had a very totalitarian view. And this is where the NWA, and I've raised this at annual meetings, needed to learn its lesson because history can repeat itself. Uh, when Vince McMahon Jr. decided that he was going to go beyond what used to be a very finite boundary territory that his father nurtured, he took advantage of the fact that the NWA promoters were so busy fighting one another that they didn't see the common enemy sneaking up on them. Right. When he bought away their TV time, when he hired away their top talent, he virtually put them out of business. Right. And he reduced the prestige of the organization because what was left for the consumer were crumbs. They lost their major promotional vehicle, of course, in television. Uh, you saw something like that repeat itself with WCW. When they were winning the rating wars, when they were getting back to a, a quasi-NWA-themed methodology of delivering product, they were fine. And then when they got stupid and it became one individual's play toy, the same person who wrote the book I cited right. about a minute ago, uh, they went from the top of the heap to the sub-basement. That wasn't murder. That was suicide. And it was one of the dumbest things that can be chronicled in the history of the industry. Now, the NWA, the leadership of the NWA as it exists right at this minute is a different mindset. It's a mindset where you have people like myself who have been in this first as a fan and then uh, in the case of, of one of the gentlemen uh, where his father was involved, going back to the days of Eddie Graham in Florida, and they understand the psychology. They understand what has to be done so that wrestling goes way beyond the 21st century. We want it to be here 
you know, in Star Trek days when that when that program becomes a reality. We we want it to continue. Uh, and 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 to do that, we've got to get away from the sideshow circus-like atmosphere. It, it, it was fine to kick off WrestleMania, but it should have been a one-time thing, and it wasn't. I said earlier in your broadcast, and I believe this firmly, the job has become so much harder for people like Tasha, for good meat and potatoes, nuts and bolt, bolts, professional wrestlers. They have made it so much harder. They have increased the risk of injury. It's not a career anymore. These, the doctors can only put these kids back together so many times. Amen. What is the longevity? Look at Shawn Michaels, for heaven's sake. Look at Steve Austin. You're not going to have people who like Nikolai Volkov, Carl uh, Von Hess, Buddy Rogers, Fez, Danny Hodge, who are in there 30, 40 years. Not with what they're doing. You know, when you said, when New Jack started jumping off the balcony at the ECW arena in Philadelphia, which is about 60 miles from where I'm sitting now, when they start yelling boring after they've seen it for the eighth time, what are you going to do? You're going to start cutting off fingers. You're going to have a circumcision in the middle of the ring. That'd be, com that, that'd be combat zone wrestling. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, was, people Zandig. have... That's kind of a reflection on our society, though. That's not just professional wrestling, and that's what's unfortunate. People are desensitized. They don't care. People go to rodeos to see people get trampled by bulls. They go to stock car races to see people crash. Yes. That's just the yes. fact of the matter. Yeah. They go to professional wrestling, used to go to professional wrestling, I will say, because they were going to see somebody get beat up. Now what they have been spoon-fed for the last several years is a soap opera in prime time for men between the ages of 18 and 35. It's called WWE. It is not professional wrestling. It is sports entertainment. It is exactly what they call it. Heavy emphasis on the entertainment. They've taken all of the sport out of the sport of professional wrestling. The NWA is stepping up now, and I'm so excited to be a part of this restructuring. They're saying our traditions have always built legends, and our traditions are going to continue to build legends. When the entertainers in the WWE can't be glued back together anymore, our wrestlers are still going to be in the ring doing exactly what I hear every single week at every venue that I go to from the fans and what they want to see professional wrestling well tasha again uh you you are saying this with with laser accuracy that is the goal uh why because we inherited something valuable we inherited something with a rich history and also to be a businessman for a minute we inherited something that worked right we inherited a product remember those those matches uh, and I, I, I am a Yankee. Uh, I, like I said, I'm Bronx born and, 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 and bred. But it was NWA back in the days when it hooked me in as a fan. It was the territory system where somebody came in for three months and then they moved on. And you said it, Eddie. Bravo to what you said. The bloodletting wasn't gratuitous. People compensate for lack of talent by slicing themselves apart like a piece of meat. And I cannot tell you the number of times I have seen it go bad because they don't have a clue what in the hell they're doing. Things have to have a purpose. Having a missile without a guidance system can only result in catastrophe. <laughs> and that is what is happening to this industry. People want a bloodbath, and they're not even brought out by the blood anymore because there's no purpose. There's no storyline. There's no continuity. Mm. Okay? It is not believable anymore. Mm. They're not yelling fake because somebody told them that the ending of the match is predetermined. They're yelling fake because the stuff that's being put out there, it, it, it's, it's like a Broadway play that's done without a script, done without cues done without any type of sequence of events or a program. It's totally disorganized. It's an unshuffled deck of cards. 
and it's the it's the, that part of it. I'm sorry. I have seen promoters that do not have the courage, the intelligence, or the intestinal fortitude to be a boss. They want to parade around with their belly sticking out, uh, trying to hit on one of the females who they've employed for that night to wrestle, uh, and they don't want to go back and go over the matches. Uh, they don't want to make sure that the show is structured in a way so that, yes, while it's professional wrestling, while it's athletics, it still has to be entertainment. And let me end this question with this. Another one of my, my, my vulgarities, I do not like sports entertainment. I watched when Linda McMahon stood in the Meadowlands surrounded by the headbangers. And I watched when our candidate for Senate, God save us, uh, told the entire world that what her company presented was fake. Talk about somebody that desecrated everything that the Lutheses and those in that, that generation gave their lives for. And why did she do it? Well, I'm going to tell you why she did it. Because by doing that, her company saved the 5% tax that the New Jersey Athletic Control Board imposed. Right. By doing that, her company no longer had to carry certain types of insurance. By doing that, her company was exempted from having immediate electrocardiograms, blood pressure checks and things that were there as safeguards to make sure that a professional wrestler who might not even know that something was wrong with them wrong with them went in the ring and ended up dying there uh i have a problem with that i have a problem with somebody pulling camouflage somebody who's created horrible stereotypes of women of uh, uh, of invalids uh trying to get themselves into the government of this country don't get me started on that because I belong to the same party that she does, okay? But I have a horrible, right now, the public relations, the multi-million, if not billion-dollar cleansing campaign. I watched one of the ads tonight and almost made me wretch. I, 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 forgive me, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. It's okay. We could stand by one second. There's one thing I want to hit. I have to say this, and this is something that is near and dear to me, and the four of us are proving it right here, right now. Conversation is a part of the art of the promo. When Vince McMahon Jr. pulled the talent raids on the UWF, on Crockett, on um, World Class, on all the different areas that he hit, Don Owens in Portland. I've got to kind of catch you on Vince pulling it on World Class, though. Jared did that. Okay. Thank you. One thing that he did was he brought in some of the best talkers in this industry. Savage, Hogan, who had the personality. When he finally got Rhodes up there, one of the best talkers in the business. When Flair finally went up there, one of the best talkers in this business. One thing that we've gotten away from in this industry, and it's not just NWA, it's all the way across the board. Why do you think there's only a certain select group of people who touch a microphone when the Attitude Era was running wild? Taker, Austin, Trip, Rock, you had people, you had multiple people who could work as, work a microphone, work the stick, even Shane, Michaels, Shawn Michaels, Shane McMahon is who I was trying to say. You had people who could work a microphone. That is something that our industry as a whole has gotten away from. I will say it like this. I've heard Tasha throw promos. Excellent on the microphone. She can work the microphone to the point where she can bring butts into the chairs, to use that ever so infamous phrase. My tag team partner who's back with us, who I'm about to turn it over to for a second, the Wicked Nemesis plays the role to perfection to talk butts into the chairs. As an announce I started out as a, as a as a manager. I learned the art very quickly of how to cut that promo and get people to and draw heat without cutting stealing heat from the people that I was managing. I learned the art of being able to talk butts into the chairs. 
And based on the conversation we're having right now, if we give you a microphone on a national forum or even on a local forum, I guarantee you we can pay you that same homage. But that is something that is lost. Why do you think that so many people are incorporating such a dangerous move set into their <clears throat> skill set? Because half the kids, and I use that term very seriously, half the kids who are training in this business today don't have the charisma, the mentality, or the personality. Sorry, this is legit. This is as real as it gets. Don't have the personality, the mindset, the charisma, the intelligence, and the aptitude to work a microphone properly. Everybody wants to be the hero. Remember, even Superman had to say the right thing at the right time. Wonder Woman said the right thing at the right time. Even Ted Knight in the role of the state. Meanwhile, back at the halls of justice. But the art of the promo is something that is going to have to be. Have to be. When, when right now, from what I've heard in recent days, Dusty Rhodes himself was down at FCW conducting classes on how to cut promos. Thank God. I referred to Dwayne Johnson as the second coming of Dusty Rhodes on the microphone. Dusty was actually flattered by that when I interviewed him back in the back in the late nineties, around two thousand. But the thing about it is, and this is something where I will agree with what you said about the you know everybody going for the high flying, and it's not a career anymore. It's only a couple of years with a life expectancy because everybody's putting their ass on the, their backsides. On, I have a standing rule: hell damn ass are perfectly acceptable. That's FCC compliance. Um, so from that vantage point, they're doing that to compensate for something else. We have the running gag in life. The the forty five year old guy who drives around in the H the Hummer. I think he's trying to compensate for something. We do this because people do the crazier things because they're trying to compensate for something. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm absolutely gold on the microphone every time. I think I stutter more often than Congress screws up. I'm a constitutionalist, by the way, and <laughs> so I don't I don't claim either of the big two. I vote issues, not personality. Substance matters. I respect that. And the fact of the matter is, it's something that we've got to be able to help people to understand. A lot of people who don't understand the business will hear Wicked Nemesis on a microphone and go, "When's he going to stop ranting?" Because they're not looking at the crowd when they ask that question. You look at the crowd. When he's being able to elicit that emotional response from people. When he's got people ready to say, I hate you. Bingo! He's done his job. They've made the emotional investment. When Tasha Simone is doing a build-up for a match, regardless of who is in the other corner, that other person can be an absolute heel in 49 out of 50 states, but for that night, she's the hero. Getting ready to take on the women's champion. And Tasha Simone elicits that emotional reaction from those people, and they look her straight in the eye. Oh, I can't stand you. Bingo. Thank you. Right there. You've made that emotional investment. When I walk, break that curtain, and I manage to get the crowd to get the show started, I have a tradition where I will say on the count of three, everybody say, ring that bell, one, two, three. And I hear every voice in that arena, every voice in that gymnasium, and whatever building it may be, scream, ring that bell. I know it's going to be a good night. But it's got to be something that we have to teach the ones who are coming up now, whether it be in an NWA promotion or in a, in a non-affiliated independent promotion. They have to be able to verbally make that emotional connection with the crowd to where that person can say, I'm spending 10 bucks to go see this guy next week. Or I'm spending 10 bucks to go see this girl next week. I'm going to spend my money, go grab a box of popcorn, grab a soda, sit back and enjoy the show, and let's have some fun with this. And I will shut up and say, Wicked Nemesis, come on back on board. Well, I actually have a, uh, I guess it could be an open table question really quick. Uh, does everyone feel that would TNA kind of fall into the wayside, that perhaps the NWA could be that promotion to step up and be considered the number two. Maybe not enough to have another Monday Night War, but enough to where they're on the same scale with WWE or at least 
be taken in the run, so to speak. Let yes. me go ahead, Tasha. I yield. No, I'm saying it. that's my answer. Yes, I think we can. People forget that independent wrestling is always going to be the backbone. Do I think NWA is is or should be considered independent wrestling? No. We are viewed that way because we are not on television every Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday night. I believe that there is too much of something that is being promoted as wrestling on television right now. I think there's overkill. I think that we need to get people back to the arenas so that they can see what it is to see live professional wrestling. I think the NWA is the perfect answer to that. Well, without uh, without going into areas that I'm honor bound not to, let me tell you that that certainly is the goal. At the risk of of, of sounding uh, like I'm puffing out my chest, there are going to be two men whom I'm working with uh, who are dedicated to doing just that. And there is a cogent business strategy that is laid out. And we are going to weed out those who simply are incapable of carrying it out. Uh, I've had intense discussions with Tasha, intense discussions with some of her male counterparts, as have two men who I do hope will be your guests, Eddie, in the not-too-distant future, uh, one of them is R. Bruce Tharp, and the other one is my, my other good friend, Chris Ronquillo, both of whom are Texicans, as I like to call them. Our door is uh, open. Yeah, and uh, I think you will find when they are prepared to announce what is going to happen, I think you and, and certainly Wicked Nemesis and Tasha will find it to be a long overdue breath of fresh air. But while I have Tasha on the spot, let me just, let, let, let's see how good her memory is. Did you ever work a match where I was the referee? I sure did. Now let me see how good your, your memory is. Okay. Which one of the three ladies in that three-way dance was good enough and tough enough to bend the chair that is now hanging in the NWA Hall of Fame with my name, Christy Ritchie's name, and Lexi Fife's name on it. And that was the 2005 NWA 57th anniversary show at the Tennessee Fairgrounds in Nashville. It sure was. We were third from the top of the night, and out of over 20 matches, I can say, and Bobby Eaton said it better than ever, it says a lot when women care enough to be one of the top three matches out of over 20 on a card. And I will say this for my sisters in crime that night, and Fred, because he was definitely part of the match, we tore the house down and we had one hell of a match. Yes, yes you did. And they were in there uh, with some of the, some of the, male, the male workers that were in there. They were in there with a potpourri of what was the indie excellence at the time. Uh, some very, very familiar names, some people who uh -huh. I miss dearly and uh, never try and upstage a woman. It always seems to lay an egg. But uh, <laughs> that was a match that I, that I never forgot. I was honored to be a part of it. Uh, I will tell you that that match exhausted me. Okay? It bloody well exhausted me because the way that these women worked in the ring, believe me, Believe me when I tell you that it far overshadowed, uh, right up to and including the uh, the uh, Nashville street fight with such greats as Eric Young and I think Cassidy Riley out of New Orleans uh, was Steven. in that one. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, yeah, it was Christy defeating Christy Ritchie defeated Lexi Fife and Tasha Simone in a triple threat match. But there was there were three winners that night. Because as I recall it, and I have the video somewhere, uh, you ladies, you know, Gorilla Monsoon used to say it, and, and if it was ever apropos, it was apropos about that match. 
that match was fit to be a main event in any arena, in any city, in any state, in our country. Thank so, you. It, no, no, thank you. Okay, thank you, because that to me, that's, that's the, uh, uh, when you work as a referee, when you work as a referee who has an affection for an industry, and you see three people like yourself, Christy, and Lexi work that hard, and it validates, it validates your beliefs, and it makes you realize that fighting to keep the values of the industry, to restore the values of the industry, to police the, the industry, when, when it's validated and you know that yours is a noble endeavor, when you know that there are people out there who feel the same way you do. We came together, never meeting each other. I'm a Yankee. You're a Southern Belle, okay? There were people from all over who understood. They were purists. They had enough within themselves to chase the star and keep their feet on the ground at the very same time. And they did that. Yeah, there were 20 matches on the show, some of them quite horrible. Some of them were exactly, Tasha, what you said. They had no business being in the ring. Yep. Yours was at the other end of the spectrum. I remember it well. It's on my list. I maintain a list of favorites. There's some interesting matches on there. Series I did with Manny Fernandez. A bunch I did with a man who I partner with promoting now. Uh, Iron Man Tommy Cairo. Hmm. Uh, some of the ones that I feel had the NWA flavor in them. Uh, that uh, that I will will never ever forget. But that night in Tennessee was a very, very special night because I remember that when I left the building that night, uh, I, I felt to, that I was very privileged to have been, well, in this case, it would have been the fourth person in the ring. Uh, we usually say the third man in the ring, but uh, it was <laughs> You were the only man in the ring. <laughs> One guy and three beautiful women that are out to tear each other apart. Is this a dream job? Amen. Fred, on, since I... we're talking Ed. about memory, do you actually remember what the very first thing that happened in that match was? It's so fortunate that Lexi got out of the way. I cannot say that I do. This is... I don't know how many people know this, and I don't mind saying it. It is a known fact that Leilani Kai trained Christy Ritchie. It is a somewhat well-known fact that I polished Christy Ritchie after she was trained. Christy and I have a love-hate relationship. We love to hate each other. True story. Whereas, Lexi was in the center of the ring. I won't say that Christy and I were really trying to both clothesline her at the same time, but it's a very huge possibility but Lexi was fortunate enough to get out of the way at the last minute. And Christy and I hit each other like two bulls with clotheslines. And the first thing that she said when we got to the back was, I think that my bridges are still intact because Christy had bridges well, at the top of her mouth. Oh, boy. Yes, true story. <laughs> wow. I have had... Uh... You know, and I don't want to cheapen the integrity of this broadcast. I would never do that. But uh, usually when there's a, a women's match, and I've been in some that are outright, uh, they're, they're, they're comedies. I mean, I've had my pants pulled down. Uh, I've been spanked. I've been this. I've been that. Uh, I had a legendary match, and, and it was a complete accident. I mean, it was as, as much of a shoot as a shoot can be. It was uh, Debbie Combs against Sherry Martell, at the old uh, convention center on the boardwalk in Wildwood, New Jersey. Which did Sherry was, destroy her? Not only did Sherry destroy her, we battled out onto the boardwalk. We knocked over a baby carriage where fortunately <laughs> the child was not in it at the time. But the, 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 the most incredible moment of it came. Sherry, when Sherry got into it, Sherry was as intense as intense could be. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to tell her, and finally, I got her ear, and I said, do you feel a draft? And she looked at me. What in the blank are you talking about? I said, my good woman, your left bosom has been out for about the past 30 seconds, <laughs> and I'm doing my best 
to stay close to you so that you don't give the fans a free show. <laughs> we well, hold on now. You talked about Leilani Kai and Christy Ricci, and you talked about you know. It's funny because there's a great transition to to something very near and dear to my heart, and you know where I'm going with this, Tasha. Calm like a bomb, Pandora. My charge. You know, you said you've had all these funny ha ha moments. You know, I, I'm basically a nobody in the NWA right now. But I, I dare say, Mr. Richards, you should be the referee September 8th for Calm Like a Bomb Pandora against the NWA Women's World Champion Tasha Simone in this no holds barred match, which has been sanctioned. Because I think that's what this needs. I think that match needs a great referee to, to take it over. And then you, then you can raise the hand of your future NWA Women's World Champion, Calm Like a Bomb Pandora. I think that will be great. And then we will sign an autograph for you if need be because, you know, <laughs> we are fan favorites there. And you can put that in the Hall of Fame as well, I'm just saying. Have you been shopping in that store on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, the one that sells mirrors that lie to you? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's got the biggest ego of them all? Me. Do you really think you're going to predict that Tasha Simone, Tasha Simone, a woman who is tough as concrete, who is as sharp as a nail, is going to lose her belt? You think you know that? Because if you do, please call my bookmaker in New York so I can make a few bucks. Oh, yes, I Everybody know. has to have something to believe in. Let them believe their little fairy tale. I believe in the Easter Bunny, but he hasn't come hopping down my lawn yet. You haven't found the right. Never mind. <laughs> well, we all know T Tasha has brought nothing but respect to that title. There is no women's title. I've said this in NWA Top Rope before. There is no women's title in the entire world that means anything compared to that crown jewel of the National Wrestling Alliance being the NWA Women's World, world Champion. That title means more to myself and Calm Like a Bomb Pandora than anything in the world. And we kind of love them in Tennessee behind us. We have the fans behind us. That We can't say that too often, but the fans are tired. And like I told Tasha, and I will tell you too, Mr. Richards, because you've been around enough, it's like the old gunslinger. The great legendary gunslinger doesn't want to be taken out by some Johnny come lately, somebody that happens to grazingly shoot them in the middle. They want to be taken out by one of the best. Who better to carry that title after Tasha Simone than calm like a bomb Pandora? And that's not taking anything away from Tasha. Tasha is, to me, the greatest women's wrestler of our generation. Far wow. none. But, but she's not calm like a bomb Pandora. She's wrestled on every continent except for Antarctica, but she's not calm like a bomb Pandora. She's been up and down, left and right, defended against men, defended against everything, from a bear probably. I, I guarantee you she's wrestled a bear sometimes just to keep that title in front of everybody's eyes because that's what a real champion does. There you go. Only a dragon, not the bear. Um, sorry, wow. champ. I love, you. I love you, big sis, but you know what's coming September 8th. Well, this is my prediction. This is my guarantee for this match. Uh oh. I guarantee this. This match is going to set a completely new standard for violence and brutality. And I will put this to my male peers, Adam Pierce and Colt Cabana. You are going to need to watch this match to find out what any level of hate truly is. Because September the 8th in Lebanon, Tennessee, I promise you that the entire wrestling world and definitely the NWA and the Merchants of Death, Wicked Nemesis, and Calm Like a Ball and Pandora are going to find out why there is a saying that says, Hell hath no fury like Sasha pissed off. And therein lies one of my favorite issues. Championships. Titles. 
dreams, goals, aspirations. Every young lady who wants to step into a building, step into a venue, to step into a ring and train to become a professional wrestler, not a diva, not a knockout. Sorry for using profanity on my show. Of course, I'm also remembering when the word knockout actually meant something. I think that was when the division was being run by the Netherlands. <clears throat> Look, this is all about one thing. This is about two warriors, Eddie. These are two warriors, two gunfighters. Let me get this there. This is a gunfight at the OK Corral again. They battled in January. Eddie, you were there. Yes. You were there. With, I, I was ringside. You were there announcing you saw this. You saw this was match of the year, and nobody knows about it. The NWA barely acknowledged this match happening. True. Very true. But everybody that was there knows it was the match of the year. Everybody that had seen what little bit of the match, because a 38-minute match. Listen to this, Mr. Richards. 38-minute women's match. A 38-minute. They went from turnbuckle to turnbuckle, from top to top, from corner to turnbuckle. Everywhere. This was a great match. This is the rematch. Very seldom does this happen, and it's going to happen. There is nothing that has been out in the last 10 years that is on TV, that has been under the NWA banner, that has been under any banner in the entire world like what's going to happen September 8th. For anybody that's not going to be there, they are missing out. They cannot call themselves a wrestling fan. And I know that Simply Perfection is going to be there. We all know that. Simply Perfection, everywhere Tasha goes, Simply Perfection goes. Well, you know, good and well, I have a contingency plan for you. My words are always very close, sir. Let me let me get this in, Wicked, because this is something that I was trying to say. I'm sorry. Whether you're in Tennessee, whether you're in Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, Arkansas, doesn't matter. The night at NWA Top Rope, where Tasha Simone defends the NWA Women's World Championship against Calm Like a Bomb Pandora. I was there for the first match, as Wicked Nemesis just said. I wish I could be there for this next match. But for any girl, for any lady, any woman who wants to get in this industry, who wants to train to be a professional wrestler, not a diva, not a knockout, this match is a must not a lot of people know where Lebanon, Tennessee is. You better find out. And you better find out real quick. Now, that part having been said, this leads me to my next one. And I'm going to make this one a brief one. And Mr. Richards, this was put directly, um, directly to you. Okay. And Tasha and I have had this discussion. Wicked's been a part, Wicked and I have had this discussion about in the 80s and early 90s, there was an East Coast, West Coast mm, feud, rivalry, competition between the rappers and the hip-hop industry. And in the modern era, and this is one, like I say, it may be a touchy subject, but I, you have two different mentalities coming into the National Wrestling Alliance. You have promoters on the West Coast, Rod Doblin, Marquez, you know, um, there are about four or five others that try to come to my mind. And then you have an East Coast NWA led by various promoters. It seems like, to a degree, behind the scenes, the East Coast is a little bit more organized than the West. Whereas on the West Coast, the, it's outwardly a little bit more organized. But I don't know about the inner workings because I have never had. Um, I've tried to interview Dave Marquez before. I've tried to interview Rod Dovlin before, as well as some of the other West Coast promoters. Can we hope to see a unity to where it's genuinely a national wrestling alliance? Let me answer that directly and unequivocally because this I can respond to, and I thank you for answering for asking the question. The, this is the job of the office, and the management of the office has changed. I am not criticizing 
previous management, we just have different philosophies, we have different styles. The National Wrestling Alliance will th flow through the hub. It will be a hub and a spoke. We will make sure that the fans and that those who are our standard bearers, as Ms. Simone is at this very moment in time, receive the benefit for the industry and this is part of the respect for the profession that we've talked about all through this broadcast we want to see the champions go all over the united states we want to see the champions go all over the world the national wrestling alliance for it to be an alliance it has to be more than simply a fraternity of promoters that make up t-shirts with the same logo those days are over they've already ended the restructuring the new methods and procedures the mandatory methods and procedures pens have already been put to paper this is going to start way before you have your christmas trees and menorahs up for the winter holidays this is going to be a benefit for this industry and I think that the promoters themselves will come to welcome it because we believe it's a blueprint for success at the box office. And you mentioned the word champions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to sound like a worker mark for a second. Wicked, you've been in the home studio here at the Full Range Entertainment Studios. You've seen the two, uh, three belts in particular. I have certain replica belts that I have in my studio. One, WCW World Tag Team title. One, the ECW World title. But hanging higher than the other two is the 10 pounds of gold. I have a replica of the National Wrestling Alliance World Heavyweight Championship, the 10 pound, which would also be called the Deluxe Edition because the dome actually protrudes. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is where those three belts means something to me in this particular regard. Number one, back when the WCW tag belts were in that particular incarnation, I made sure to get the version with the eagle, not the one without. Tag team wrestling meant something in world championship wrestling. The, extre the ECW world championship, because at that time, ECW was considered groundbreaking and was going in a different direction from the norm. And the 10 pounds of gold hangs there for the tradition. What I spoke of earlier, the background in professional wrestling, not split entertainment, which I will do that nine times out of 10, by the way, because I'm trying to suppress a barf. <clears throat> Sorry. But the champions, to me, no matter what broadcast it is, whether it's NWA Hollywood, whether it's NWA Anarchy, whether it's Howard Brody and Ring Warriors down in the Florida market. The champions have to be placed in that public eye, on that pedestal. Champions such as La Reina del Pal Driver, Tasha Simone, the Dark City Fight Club, John Davis, Corey Chavis, the junior heavyweight champion, the modern-day hero, Kevin Douglas, as of this taping. And, unless something has happened over the last 48 hours, the one who holds Sweet Charlotte, Adam Pierce. I haven't gotten my recent update, so I'm not sure what's happened in the seven levels of hate. Can we see that elevation, that return to glory, to use that expression, the return to prominence, the elevation to prominence, of not only the Heritage Championship state titles, regional titles like the North American title or the national championship but the world titles can we hope to see those championships defended in different areas of the country because I know for fact people on the west coast who love professional wrestling would love to see Tasha Simone out on the west coast whether it be Cali, Oregon, New Mexico, Arizona Nevada just like they would like to see DCFC Kevin Douglas is all over the place defending the junior title. And we know about Pierce's schedule and Cabana's schedule when he held the belt. I think Pierce was actually more of a traveling champion 
in my book. That's just me. Mm-hmm. But can we see that return to prominence for the world champions? I have three words to answer you with. I guarantee it. Because the reason why, once again, there's a reason why a that championship hangs higher than anything else. You say the letters you say the letters NWA. You say the words National Wrestling Alliance. That's why Wicked Nemesis is pushing Come Like a Bomb Pandora. That's why Pandora is pushing herself. Because they want that championship. A world title. The world title. I didn't mean to disrespect when I said A. I, I meant the from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Because some very talented professionals have held that championship. And I'm sure for Wicked Nemesis and Pandora, that would be the validation of being a professional in this industry is the women's world championship. Just like you've got I've said this before, Tasha said it before, Wicked and I have agreed, Mabo, Mark Bowman, who I wish we I wish he could be here for this. When you start training in this business I don't care if, and here goes the wall for a second. I don't care if you want to be hero or villain, face or heel, protagonist or antagonist. If your ultimate goal is to not be good enough to push yourself to be the very best and worthy of holding the world championship, whether it be a single or tag, junior or heavy, men's or women's, doesn't matter. The world championship should be your goal. It was mine when I first started. I just found a different calling. Because I had dreams of holding that 10 pounds of gold in real time and not a replica. That and other things held me back. Then you don't need to be in this business. Because to be a champion, that means you dedicate yourself. And to be an NWA champion means you have dedicated yourself that much more to uphold the traditions the standards of the National Wrestling Alliance. Tasha, agree or disagree? I do agree. Um, you know, I, I've said this so many times that a belt doesn't make a wrestler and so many people think that it, that it does. The wrestler has to bring prominence. It's our job to bring prominence to the belt and to the company that we represent. The minute I became the NWA World Champion, I was not only representing professional wrestling to the standards that the NWA upholds, but I also became a representative, a public spokesperson for the National Wrestling Alliance. That's what every champion should be. The champion is the zenith, the top of the mountain, the top of the crown and the Statue of Liberty. The champion is Mount Everest. It's somebody who has put in the dedication, the blood, the sweat, the tears to get the, to the top of their professional ladder. The champion is the one who does not back down from anyone because they understand that if they did, then they're not a champion. The champion is the one who knows every rivet on that championship belt and understands that the people who wore it before they did were the people who pioneered, who laid the groundwork, who paved the roads for their reign with that gold around their midsection. Tasha, Adam Pierce, Cahagas, Dark City Fight Club, Kevin Douglas, they paid their dues. Kevin Douglas, whom I worked with just this past Friday night in Houston, I had the honor of doing the final match where Kevin won that belt in Charlotte on October 7th of 2011. I have gotten to know Kevin. I was sitting in a... Uh, in a, in, a, in, in a courtroom and 
this this can be put out because it's public record. And and Kevin Douglas sat there and he told the story, and he gave an essay, a strictly off the cuff spur of the moment essay, as to what the championship meant to him, the sacrifices he made. It was an American success story like none other that I had heard. It wasn't about corkscrewing, backstabbing, or dirty dealing. It was a young man who packed a bag, got in the car, drove 10 hours, wrestled, got in the car, drove another 10 hours, went to the laundromat to clean his wrestling tights, <laughs> did whatever he had to do to set up the chairs, help with the ring, okay. and then got he in that... He has cauliflower ears. Yeah, he does. He has got I love the Kevin. hallmark. Kevin, Kevin is a modern day hero, and he's inspirational. Yeah. He is very, very inspirational. He is. He, he, he. I can't say enough good things about him, because I can only imagine the pride that his parents and that his wife and that his family feel about him. He redefines champion. This is the type of person who wins the gold because they are willing to pay the price. It's more than pinning somebody's shoulders to the mat. Mm -hmm. It's more than making them submit. It, it, it's, it's getting in there with rock-solid perseverance and determination and doing whatever might be necessary within the rules and values of your chosen profession to get to the executive suite. Tasha did it. Adam did it. So many people have done it. Only a select few. There have been thousands of wrestlers that have passed through National Wrestling Alliance rings since the organization was codified back in 1948. But there have only been a virtual handful that have risen to the point where they are worthy of the title champion. Wicked Nemesis, come on in one more time. I have to ask uh, one question. What has been your favorite moment so far in wrestling? My favorite moment? Yes, sir. Uh, now, I just have to ask you, is that uh, <laughs> when I was refereeing as a fan or either of the above? Either of the above, sir. What is the one oh. moment that you think, you know, you're like, oh, yes, I'm so proud to be a wrestler, whether it was when you were a kid, whether it was when you were in the business? Well... When I, I, I'm going to go back to when I was a kid and I was 13 and I just, I, I, I mentioned the match before and, and, and one little anecdote I didn't give you about it. Uh, the match was the night in June of 63 when Bruno San Martino became, uh, when the NWA, when Vince Sr. left, uh, and it, it was the first night that the WWWF championship was created. I remember being in the garden and watching it. Uh, and I remember many years later sitting in another famous NWA venue, the, the uh, Jersey City, New Jersey Armory, where Willie Gilsenberg used to promote. And Bruno was there at the show uh, just to, to sign autographs. And I told him, oh, yeah, I remember the match. And he looked at me, and I could see the skepticism because he had probably heard that a lot. And then I told him, now remember, this match had happened. 40 years before, and I took him through exactly what went on. And I told him who the referee was. I told him who the timekeeper was. I told him the ring announcer was Al Mitchell. Uh, the timekeeper was Georgie Brown. The referee was Eddie Gersh. And I said, that match happened because Buddy rushed you. Eddie Gersh, who always wore black sneakers to referee, called for the bell. Uh, you shot him into the bear hug twice. He raked your eyes. Then you picked him up in the backbreaker. He submitted 48 seconds later, Madison Square Garden was a riot zone. He looked me in the eyes, he said, you were there. And I said, yes, I was. And I'll never forget it until the day I die. That was the most memorable moment that I've, that, that professional wrestling has, has given me. And I shall never forget one second of those 48 seconds. On the show, we have a tradition for those who stay for the final segment. It's called Last Call. It is an opportunity to voice an opinion, make a statement, or as you said about Kevin Douglas, pop an essay in however form you like on any topic, whether it be the topics we've hit tonight or something else that you want to bring into the forefront. 
and I make that pass all the way around, and I'm a, I'm in this order. I'm going to go with Wicked first, Tasha second. Um, I'll go third, and our esteemed guest, Mr. Richards, will go and clean up. Wicked Nemesis, last call. We'll pick him back up. Tasha Simone, last call. Well, I'm actually going to make a confession so that maybe everybody who hears this will truly understand the importance that the NWA holds with me. The night that I won the belt for the first time, before I passed out from blood loss, because I did pass out from blood loss after the match, when Mike Percy handed me the belt after I had pinned mischief, I fell to my knees in the middle of the ring, and, and you know me. You've met me, Eddie. You know that this is what I'm about to say is not something that was common or that would be considered common for me. Okay. I had tears running down my face. The reason that I had tears running down my face is because this is what I wrestle for. And that is something that people need to understand when they see any man or woman fall into an NWA ring. When they say, I want to be the champion, they don't mean it because they want a piece of gold around their waist and say, hey, let me go take pictures with my friends. It's because it shows the blood, the sweat, and the tears that we have sacrificed to this industry. There is no other title for men, women, or tag teams that will ever mean more or carry more prestige than a belt that says NWA World Champion. Wicked? I think it's... Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Last call, bro. A lot of people don't know this, but I'm also a dad, and I'm sitting here uh, <clears throat> bottle-feeding my daughter... So I listen to that. Very poignant. Uh, I just want to let everyone know, thank you for listening to this. We know it's pre-recorded. But my last call is this. If you're a veteran in the locker room and you want to be taken seriously, you see something wrong, stand up. Don't wait for the promoter to do it. Take it upon yourself to be a veteran and just stand up and just take the reins and take back our business and bring respect back to the business. It starts with the vet. You know, I used words a little while ago, and we use words like this all the time on Beyond Ringside. Tradition. Respect. There's a line from one of my favorite, and y'all are going to laugh when I say this, from one of my favorite rap tracks of all time. It's called Pop Goes the Weasel by Third Base. I have a mind that doesn't have to be spoon-fed. I can read it doesn't have to be read. I say it like that, and I use that quote for this reason. The national television format right now, on Monday and Friday, and mostly on Thursday too, has a bad habit of trying to spoon-feed what they think you want to see. If you're a pure and a true fan of professional wrestling, you can stand up and call BS. Because the one thing that I never do, and I've operated my own promotion, I've booked, announced, refereed, been in ring talent, separated shoulder concussion, blown knee to prove it. Fact of the matter is, if you're a real fan of this industry, Get away from the television set. Take a look around. There are promotions that operate under the banner of the National Wrestling Alliance in all parts of the lower 48 and in Hawaii. And I think in Alaska, I got to double check. That are working to give you the absolute best for your entertainment dollar. If you think that all that's really out there is what you see on television, please think again. We're talking about a company that is 
the oldest and largest governing body of professional wrestling known the world over, period. It's not just a brand name. And you will find some of the best up-and-coming young talent. You will find some of the hardest-working real veterans under the banner of the National Wrestling Alliance. Take a look around. Find it. Look for it. And when you go, understand professional wrestling is very much alive and well. There were questions laid out there over the last few years about the status of the National Wrestling Alliance. About the early reformation. A lot of people, their only exposure to it was the time when Vince McMahon Jr. brought out Dan Severn, the Heavenly Bodies, the Rock and Roll Express, Jim Cornette, part of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, to help give Smoky Mountain a push with the NWA World Championship on WWF TV. It runs deeper than that. A lot of people, their only exposure to it was when NWA TNA was around before the split. I remember the night of that split. This is a shoot. I cried. Because I knew what was about to happen. And it did. Impact went... (laughs) The fact of the matter is, a resurgence, a rebirth, a reconstruction, maybe. Return to glory, return to prominence, quite possibly. Upholding the standards and traditions that laid the groundwork and paved the way for tomorrow... Oh, hell yeah, most definitely. And I want to take a moment to say a very special thank you, A, to multi-time NWA Women's World Champion Tasha Simone for sitting in with us this evening, and a very special thank you to the NWA Chief Official, Fred Richards, for sitting in with us this evening. And Mr. Richards, last call. I have a dream. I have a dream that happens inside a wrestling ring and I have a dream that I think has the possibility a very good possibility of becoming a reality listening to everyone tonight as we participated in this open healthy candid discussion of sentiments of vision of memory I want to see the night, whether I'm in the ring, whether I'm seated at ringside, or whether I'm at home, that a National Wrestling Alliance nationwide pay-per-view satellite feed, however they do it, when a true night of champions is presented not only for the audience, But for those champions that went through the rite of passage, for those champions that climbed the mountain, for those champions that earned the right to puff out their chest and to flex and say, I am the best of the best, that I made it, top of the world, Ma, I want to see that. I believe that the National Wrestling Alliance that the world is going to get set to meet within the next couple of months has the potential to achieve that noble goal. And I know three men, one of whom is me, that are going to work hard and do whatever it takes to make that dream become a reality. I am so honored to have been on this broadcast. I am so honored to be a part of the National Wrestling Alliance. And I want to thank you so very much. I would not have missed this for anything in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind everybody that Beyond Ringside broadcasts live on Sunday evenings, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. Hold on, 6.35, Yeah, okay. <laughs> Got to get my numbers right. No, the gimmick normally is 6.30 Eastern, 5.30 Central, and the rest of the time zones are on their own. However... 
<laughs> you can, of course, keep track of everything that happens through BeyondRingside.com. And, of course, don't forget Facebook.com slash BeyondRingsideLive is the fan page. Follow us on Twitter at BeyondRingside. Yours truly, Fast Eddie Lane, at Fast Eddie Lane. You can find the Wicked Nemesis at Wicked Nemesis over on Twitter. Uh, Tasha, would you like to lay one out there? At Tasha Simone, NWA, on Twitter. Anything that you see on Twitter is also on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com, Tasha.Simone1. And for any booking inquiries for myself or simply perfection, of course, you can always catch me at Tasha Simone NWA at gmail.com. Serious inquiries only, please, and they absolutely will have to be approved through my belt administrator. Mr. Richards, would you like to lay contact information out there? You can get me through the NWA website, which is nwawrestling.org, nwawrestling.org. I listen to all this, Twitter, Twitter, Schmatter business, <laughs> and it makes me feel like a senior citizen. Please remember I come from a generation of pinball machines and carbon paper. Yes. But thank you. You can get me through the NWA website. Myself, Bruce Tharp. Chris Ron Quillo, sky is the limit straight ahead. You can also find tag team partner Mark Mabo Bowman over on Twitter at MA underscore BO. Wicked, do you want to lay the Facebook out there real quick? Uh, yeah, Wicked Nemesis uh, Enoch Kasarian, E N O C H T S A R I O N, also YouTube, Wicked Nemesis Enoch. But more importantly, go out. And get in touch with Tasha. Tasha does not have enough followers. The end of your Women's World Champion needs to be able to vent to more people and spread her uh, gospel, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd like, we'd like to remind everybody that the best of Beyond Ringside 24 7 is available on the Shoutcast Radio Network and available through BeyondRingside.com. Folks, we we'll hope you'll join us this coming Sunday night, once again, 6.30 Eastern, 5.30 Central, as we cover wrestling, mixed martial arts, full contact FM, but please don't call us Sports Talk Radio. I hate being pigeonholed like that. For my tag team partners, Mark Mabo Bowman, in absentia this evening, brother, we'll see you Sunday. For the Oracle of Ominous, the Wicked Nemesis. The To Be Determined Show, Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, and this Saturday, Tokyo to the Center, the NWA Women's World Champion comes to... Alabama. <laughs> For the multi-time National Wrestling Alliance Women's World Champion, Tasha Simone. <laughs> For NWA Chief Official, Mr. Fred Richards. Good night, everybody. Stay well. God bless. And on behalf of the National Wrestling Alliance, thank you so very much, because without the fans, there is nothing. This is your host and moderator for Beyond Ringside, Fast Eddie Lane, saying adios, das vidanya, hasta luego, a wiedersehen, chao, sayonara, adieu, 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 farewell, adieu, 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 and until we meet again, we'll see you as we all go Beyond Ringside. Bye for now. <laughs>